Oh, hello, YouTube. Today in the Naughty Librarian, I'm giving you a brief history of the Mayfair Witches. So I read this monstrosity of a book, The Witching Hour by Anne Rice. I read the whole darn thing, whole thing. Um, a lot of this is concerned mainly with the history of all of the Mayfair Witches that have ever happened. All of them. <laughs> and it's a very long, sordid, and gross family tree. And I figured, hey, let's give everybody a little bit of a crash course in all of the Mayfair witches leading up to the present. So going all the way back to like the mid 1600s, we're gonna start off with our very first Mayfair witch, Suzanne. She was like the small town hot girl and also a healer. She just seems like very naive and uneducated essentially. She ends up learning witchcraft from this this guy, I don't know, it's just a guy who like traveled through town. He got like cut and so she was like treating his cut. And he reads her this whole book about demonology and this is kind of how she learns about witchcraft. Which honestly, I don't know if this is gonna be a thing later on, but it's, oh, it's like just strikes me as like too coincidental. Like how, how did this one guy show up at this one lady's house and teach her about witchcraft when she had no idea even how to read? You know, like, there's something fishy going on here and considering um, our, you know, our demon Lasher has been manipulating this family since always. Maybe he was even manipulating this family before he was like summoned by them. I don't know that's to be revealed, but it's very coincidental. But anyway, she learns the conjure spirits and she calls forth Lasher, who is a spirit demon entity thing and he becomes bound to Suzanne and then all of her descendants going forward till always. Suzanne also had a daughter at this time named Deborah and Suzanne got pregnant with Deborah at a Mayfair festival which is kind of like a wild party slash orgy <laughs> and no one really 100% knows who the father was but it's highly suspected that the father of her baby was the Earl of Donleith. So people are very cautious around Deborah. They don't want to hurt her just in case she is the Earl's kid, that kind of thing. However, that does not stop them from hurting Suzanne because they actually burn Suzanne at the stake for witchcraft. Deborah is about 12 years old when this happens and they make her watch it happen, um, but they won't like hurt Deborah because you know, she might be the Earl's kid. However, luckily, there was um, kind of a younger initiate of the Talamasca there named Peter. And he had been traveling around Europe kind of saving witches, witches, <laughs> from getting burned at the stake. Like, hey, I can tell you have powers, come hang out with the Talamasca. We don't burn witches, we think they're cool. And he wasn't there in time to save Suzanne, but he is there in time to save Deborah. So he like, convinces the town folk to let him take her. And they're like, please, we don't want to deal with this. <laughs> and at this very young age, and like when Peter just got there knowing nothing about Lasher, he keeps seeing Lasher as well. Like he sees Lasher around. So like, it's very obvious Lasher has been inherited by Deborah. Now, Deborah's like 12 and Peter's 18. And you know, they're both young. It's still kind of gross because he's considerably older than her. But like, he's kind of into Deborah a little bit. He doesn't ever do anything untoward to Deborah, but he is attracted to her. And he they travel all the way back across Europe back to Amsterdam, where like the Talabasca headquarters is. And he brings her there, he tries to protect her, but she's still like real cautious. She doesn't really want to like, trust people and also she thinks witches are super evil she was raised to believe that so she doesn't want to talk about witchcraft she has like some obvious trauma she needs to work out the talamasca keeps pushing and she's like you know what fuck all y'all bitches lasher fuck them up so she calls lasher lasher like throws a bunch of shit around and causes all this like chaos and Deborah escapes and she's fine. She ends up marrying um, like an old artist, like a really old one, <laughs> like a really old guy. She marries him. They become rather wealthy because Lasher is very adept at like finding little coins and jewels and money and stuff and giving them to Deborah. So she just has an unending purse. She just it constantly gets refilled by Lasher. And eventually the husband dies and she calls for Peter. And ultimately she's like, I love you. And I know that you're in love with me too. So like, 
let's have sex. So she like basically says like, I want to be with you at least once because I'm like already a fianced to, to some French count and like he's nice enough or whatever. But like, you're the one I want to be with at least once unless you want to marry me, huh, Peter? You want to get married? And Peter's like, no, because I'm still like really devoted to the Talamasca. There's nothing against marrying people in the Talamasca. He just wasn't ready to marry her. And so they they have their sex <laughs> and and Deborah leaves and she goes off and, and marries the, the count in France and uh, she gives birth to a daughter a little too soon at, bef after the wedding. <laughs> so obviously the count is not the father, Peter is the father. However, things go really well for her in France again. Um, the, the count that she married was quite, you know, dashing and, and handsome and rich and nice enough. So she, she has a good life there. She likes him fine and they have several children as well. Um, she is actually really well liked around town. She has like kind of a reputation as being a healer and this is going great until the day her husband gets very grievously wounded and she's not able to heal him. Like it's way more than like bumps and bruises. Like this is bad. And so he's dying and he's like, why won't you heal me? And she's like, I can't, you're super fucked up. And he's like, oh yeah, well I'm telling everybody you're a witch. So he tells like the priest that she's a witch and his mom and dad like jump on the, the let's call Deborah witch train. And then even her sons, her fucking kids like get on the call Deborah witch train. And so she gets accused of witchcraft very formally and gets arrested. And then, you know, when you're arrested as a witch, it's just torture all the time trying to get you to quote confess. She never confesses to anything. Um, Lasher isn't really able to help her. You know, he's good at getting little coins, but like breaking someone out of prison, it's a bit above his like abilities. And Peter hears about it, so he goes to her um, and he gets in and he sees her and he comforts her while she's in jail. He wants to try to save her, but like ultimately there's, there's literally nothing he can do. Like besides what, grab her and run? Like, <laughs> like there's nothing he can do to get her out of prison. He's trying, but he knows that she's gonna get burned as a witch. The only like upside of this is that as soon as like her mother really got captured for witchcraft, her daughter Charlotte and Charlotte's husband fled to the West Indies. They got the fuck out of there immediately. So she's safe at least. And, and Deborah has Peter uh, promise her that he's gonna go to Charlotte and tell her what happens to what what's about to happen to her mother. She deserves to know the full story, and also like let her know about Lasher because he's about to she's about to inherit him. Now at the day of Deborah's burning, shit gets crazy. So before they tire to the pyre, she just starts speaking up, saying, "Hey, all y'all motherfuckers out there, okay? Remember when you came to me when you were sick and like I helped you and you were all my friends, and now like all of you just hate me." You can all suck my dick. Like she's like really upset with them for a good reason. And so she calls down Lasher to fuck some peasants up. <laughs> so Lasher gets there. This whole sky gets so dark and stormy. I guess she's controlling the elements too. So it's a huge like windstorm and everything's like scary storm and like Lasher, he goes around and he like moves things and like causes accidents and like the mother-in-law like falls off a balcony and dies and then the balcony falls on her two sons who are also accusing her of witchcraft. Like all of the people accusing her of witchcraft get killed in this big melee. And in the, the chaos, Deborah flees um, into the church and runs up to the roof and Peter runs after her trying to save her, but also like, um, like the witch judge, the main witch judge guy is also chasing her town. So it's like a big chase scene. And um, they get to the roof just in time to see Deborah throw herself off of it. So she jumps off the roof to her death. And um, Peter seeing this, you know, also in love with Deborah, um, is very mad at this witch judge. So he's just like, you know what? Fuck that guy. <laughs> and he pushes the witch judge off the roof too. So he dies. So Peter killed someone. And like, it's like a big secret, but it just is what it is. He killed the witch judge. Good for him. Fuck that guy. So Peter's really heartbroken because Deborah's gone and he, he did promise her that he's going to go to the West Indies and talk to Charlotte. So he's like, all right, I'm going to go do that. The Talamasca warns him. 
hey, we got a lot of psychics like on the payroll and they say you go in the West Indies is just going to be suffering and death. Don't do not go. Re repeat, do not go. Stop. But um, you can't tell Peter nothing. So he gets on the boat. He goes to San Domingue and he and he gets in contact with Charlotte and he goes over to her big like plantation she owns. So Peter, he gives her the warnings about Lasher and how he actually has a mind of his own and tells like Charlotte the whole story about how her mother died. And, and like, let's pause for just a hot second here because like Peter full on knows that this is his daughter, biological daughter. He knows this going in. She looks like him and shit. And yet he's still like super attracted to her, like sexually attracted to her. And he comments on it in, he, he's writing this down in his own words. So it's him saying how hot he thought his daughter was. And I get it, the Mayfair women are supposed to be very alluring, but it's like your biological daughter, bro. Ew. And honestly, it just keeps getting grosser from here. It's, it didn't start out gross. It didn't. It really didn't start out gross. It gets gross now, okay? So just buckle up. There's gonna be some triggering content. Beware. So Charlotte is married to this guy named Antoine. And Antoine, actually a great guy. Um, they have a good marriage. She takes care of him mainly because he has this disease. I'm assuming it's like muscular dystrophy, but they didn't have words for it in the 1600s. And he's just, you know, his muscles and body is kind of wasting away. He's in a wheelchair. He doesn't really, he can't really move for himself. And Charlotte and Antoine had one son before his disease had progressed to the point where it is now where he's not really able to make more children. Now, the problem here is that Charlotte still wants to have more children, but she also wants to have children without the possibility of inheriting Antoine's disease and also children who are capable of seeing Lasher. She wants to continue the line of witches and have like an inheritor. And um, when she met Peter, she also knows this is her, this is her biological father. However, she thinks he's kind of hot too. Oh my God, why? But anyway, so to her, Peter is hot and available. Uh, she doesn't care that it's her biological father. And, and she thinks like, you know what, Peter? You're the man who should be giving me children. Like, we should be doing it. So she basically like bewitches or drugs him somehow. And he gets drugged and bewitched into wanting to have sex with her a lot. Like just repeatedly bang her. Like he, he's in this like trance where he can't stop having sex with Charlotte. <laughs> And Peter is just horrified by this, but he can't stop wanting to have sex with her. And like, they both kind of like fall in love with each other in a little way, but like, ew, they know their biological like father and daughter. And blah, excuse me while I throw up forever. <laughs> and it gets worse from there even. Charlotte is doing this to him. He's not consenting to it. He's, she's drugging him into like having sex with her. And she also keeps him like prisoner in like a little like guest house, a, a fuck shack, if you will. She keeps him there against his will as, as well. And she just keeps bewitching him into having more sex with her all the time until she conceives a child. And Lasher starts appearing to Peter again, and he's real jealous because he wants to be with Charlotte. Why is Peter gonna be with Charlotte? I'm jealous, why can't I be corporeal? So, you know, Lasher's having a tizzy about things. He's jealous of Peter. And Peter tells Charlotte like, hey, come get your boy. Like he's doing crazy shit. And like, Charlotte's like, no, 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 no. I have control over Lasher. Like, don't worry about it. I have forbidden him from ever hurting you. It's gonna be fine. Like, girl, famous last words. However, finally, Charlotte does conceive. And so that was the point of her keeping Peter prisoner in the fuck shack. So she lets him go because she loves him. And she doesn't want to keep him prisoner anymore because she, she's gotten what she needed. And so Peter, he leaves. He's going to go back to Amsterdam. He sends letters ahead of him to Amsterdam and locked in like iron boxes and stuff. So Lasher can't fuck with them. So like that's how people find out what happened to Peter because he never leaves the island. Um, basically, Lasher 
just keeps doing shit to Peter all the time and drives him absolutely insane. Um, just like putting visions into his head, pretending to be people he knows, like all kinds of stuff just drives him insane. And well, technically, Lasher didn't kill Peter. He set into course all the events that did kill Peter. So Peter gets killed on the island in an accident, <laughs> but like one that Lasher coordinated to happen. And in all the letters that he sent back to the Telemasca, he, he warns them, he's like, hey, listen, this family is fucked up. We don't understand enough about Lasher. Do not send any agents after me. Don't do it. Just to stay the fuck away from the Mayfairs. Trust me. So that's like the last they ever hear from Peter because he dies on the island. And it's probably the most like accurate record of the early Mayfairs because after that, the Talamasca doesn't have any real direct contact with them. So a lot of the rest of the history from then on gets a little piecework and patchwork, like finding out things and like putting clues together. The rest of it is a bit more hearsay, but let's get into it. We, we've only hit like three Mayfairs so far. There's 13 of them. <laughs> and frankly, they get more and more incestuous as time goes on. Yikes. So um, Charlotte, she ends up having twins from Peter and she names them Jean-Louise and Peter, you know, after his father and grandfather. <laughs> and, you know, to keep this grand tradition going, Jean-Louis and Peter start banging each other. Dear Lord, they're twins. I don't even understand the inbreeding happening here. It's it's elaborate. But anyway, so Jean-Louis and Peter, they're banging each other. And she ends up giving birth to Angelique. And there's not really a lot about Jean-Louis. She's just kind of lives there and manages the plantation, etc. Like she doesn't really do much. Um, so moving on, Angelique, the fifth Mayfair witch here. And luckily, Angelique kind of breaks the cycle here. She has several children with someone not related to her. Thank goodness. Um, this guy named uh, Vincent St. Christophe. So they get married. They have several kids. And some of her kids move back to France. Like after the, the French Revolution, they move back there. And um, her and her daughter is Marie Claudette. And Marie Claudette is the first Mayfair to come to America and settle in Louisiana. And she also marries someone not related to her. Love that for her. His name is Henry Landry. So they get married. They have several children. And overall, like Marie Claudette wasn't really well liked. Um, and she owned a plantation in the South. She enslaved people. You know, it, it's the South of this era. So obviously people are enslaved. And amongst the people that she enslaved, a lot of them believed her to be a sorceress. There was a lot of rumors that she had a demon that she was sick on her enemies and stuff. And uh, that's that's about it for Marie Claudette, really. She just is the first one to move to Louisiana and, and build a plantation. Um, however, she did have several children. Uh, she had Claire Marie, Pierre, and Marguerite. And moving on to the seventh witch here, Marguerite, the inheritor after Angelique. Um, Marguerite is probably the grossest of all of them. That's including those twins who banged each other. She's the grossest. Like this is a high bar to top and yet she does it. So let's get into Marguerite. Um, she's overall kind of just a really erratic person with like a vicious kind of streak to her. Um, not a nice person really in general. Um, she, she tends to marry really like frivolous men. Uh, she marries like, I think her first husband was like an opera singer. Um, eventually they're going to start stepping out on her. And when that happens, she sends Lasher to kill them. And the same thing kind of keeps happening with, um, her, her other husbands and lovers. A lot of them die in mysterious circumstances. Okay. So Marguerite is kind of like the mad scientist of the family. She also has, um, some type of like a healing touch-based ability is not really clearly um, defined because again, the Talabasca doesn't have any direct contact with the family. But uh, yeah, remember all those dead husbands? Uh, wow. Well, she was doing some experiments with the corpses. Um, basically, she would have the corpse and then Lasher would possess the corpse and then um, try to change it on a molecular level. They were trying to basically have it so Lasher could inhabit the, the dead body and then reanimate it so it would be alive again. 
it ever really worked out that way, but it worked well enough that she was able to have sex with the corpses whilst Lasher was animating them. Dear Lord, why? Why? Did you, did we need necrophilia in this? We did not, I guarantee you. And then like just the, the cherry on the gross cake here is that she kept the heads. She has jars of heads amongst other body parts of all of like her, her, her dead lovers. Um, oh my God, <laughs> like this is the worst one. Wow, I don't think you're gonna top it. That's enough with Marguerite. Let's move on to her inheritor. Catherine, her daughter. Catherine is actually the Mayfair who built the, the big Mayfair house in the Garden District of New Orleans with this architect. And his name was Darcy Monahan. And Catherine and Darcy fell in love with each other, desperately so. And they want to get married. And um, her brother Julian is super jealous and like refuses to ever talk to her again if she like marries Darcy, but yet she still marries Darcy because she's in love with him. Like Catherine is probably the nicest Mayfair out of all of them. <laughs> but anyway, she marries Darcy and Julian never steps foot in the Mayfair house. He doesn't talk to her anymore. He refuses because she married someone else and not her brother, <laughs> ew. <laughs> but anyway, so Catherine, she has a great marriage with Darcy. Unfortunately, he he dies um, from some type of sickness, and Catherine is incredibly depressed. She 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 wants she doesn't want to live anymore. She's like suicidal, and so she ends up calling Julian to come help her. And Julian finally comes to the Mayfair house. It's the first time he's ever stepped foot in it, and it's after Darcy died. So now he moves into the house to kind of take care of her. See, the only problem with that is that Julian moves into the master bedroom with Catherine. And, um, well, Catherine gives birth to a baby girl ten and a half months after her husband died. So, it's definitely not her husband's baby. It's definitely Julian's baby. So, we're back to inbreeding. So, now brother and sister have made a baby. However, the significant thing about Catherine overall is that she doesn't actually seem to have any affiliation whatsoever with Lasher which is odd because Lasher has always followed the matrilineal line of this family. But the thing is, you know who was also a really powerful witch in the family of this era? Julian, who was male. So the Talamasca believes that Julian was actually the inheritor of this generation, but couldn't officially inherit because he was male, not female. So um, Julian is basically the next witch in line because Julian had a lot of magical abilities. Also, Lasher very much resembles him. They look very similar, like almost twins. So there's a lot of um, evidence here to support that Catherine was the inheritor in name only, but it was really Julian. And Julian was quite like the dashing libertine in his day and he had multiple relationships with both men and women and really anything with a pulse, frankly. Like he had some, oh gosh, like we're not gonna get into his sexual escapades because yikes. Um, but yeah, he just, if he had a pulse and he could, and he was capable of having sex with it, he probably would. <laughs> That's Julian. And Lasher was often seen around Julian. Mind you, they look alike, like twins, um, even, like Lasher is capable of doing sexual things with the family members, obviously. And Julian and Lasher did have a sexual relationship. They were seen having it at it with each other because Lasher has been intimate with several members of the family. Um, but now Julian, so Lasher and Julian, they're banging it out. However, um, Julian actually does marry. He has a wife. Um, is this woman, Suzette. She was like a cousin, which like, on, honestly, at this point, I'm praying for cousins. Like, at least there's some separation in the family at that point. So he married like a cousin. And the marriage starts off really well. He seems really devoted to her. He has all these portraits commissioned. Um, and they they have several children. And, and most of the kids don't really do a whole lot. They just kind of go off and do their own thing. The most important child that Julian makes is Cortland, who will go on 
to father several other Mayfair witches. Oh my gosh. So um, Cortland is the only one really of any note here. But anyway, uh, Juliet and Catherine, they had a baby together and um, she names her Mary Beth. So she is the next inheritor after Catherine. And um, she grows up very, very normal. Julian dotes on her because obviously he's her father. Um, and she's just a cool lady. She's very like tough. She likes to wear men's suits. Um, she is the one who built like all of the financial dynasty of the Mayfairs. Like they were already wealthy, but she had like a head for business, like nobody's business. <laughs> and she like amassed a fortune in this era that was unheard of. Like, frankly, it's a, it's obscene how much money she she made for the family. But when uh, Mary Beth was a young woman, she and Julian went back to Scotland, where the Mayfair started back in the day. And they go to uh, they go to buy Donleith Castle. Why not? Which is, you know, the the ancestral castle of the Earl of Donleith, who allegedly fathered Deborah. So kind of family at this point. And um, here's where things get weird. Um, they send word back whilst they're in um, Scotland. They're there for like a year. And they say, hey, um, Mary Beth married a, a distant Scottish cousin, but unfortunately he died before the baby was born. Whoopsie daisy. But obviously that's not true. Julian's probably is the father of this baby. So he's her father. And then they made another baby and it's all, all and, and her parents were brother and sister and I, it hurts. <laughs> it hurts my brain. But anyways, they have a child and her name is Belle. Uh, Belle, unfortunately, has um, a lot of mental difficulties and she's described as having about the mental state of like a four-year-old. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of inbreeding going on in this family that does cause genetic mutations. Poor Belle. Um, she is well looked after, though. Everyone loves Belle, so it's not like she she's mistreated, but like, yikes. But luckily, Mary Beth doesn't continue her relationship with Julian. She ends up marrying an unrelated person to her, thank goodness, and his name is Daniel McIntyre. He was a judge. He was also a former and or current lover of Julian's. So <laughs> marrying Julian's ex-boyfriend, okay. And Mary Beth has several children. She has Carlotta, Lionel, and Stella. And both Carlotta and Lionel look a whole lot like Daniel McIntyre. Fantastic. And then Stella comes along a few years later and she doesn't look like, like Daniel. She looks a whole lot like Cortland who is Julian's son. So it's very highly suggested that Mary Beth got with Cortland, who's Julian's son, and then they made Stella. Yikes. I, I think Cortland is her like half brother slash cousin. And then they made a baby. I, you know, I'm gonna stop trying to figure out the family tree. <laughs> Why am I trying? It's very convoluted at this point. So these kids, right? Um, you have Carlotta. Um, she is still around in the present day of the Mayfairs, and she is like the Karen of the family. Um, she is just awful. Terrible and awful. She probably tells children Santa Claus isn't real just for fun. She's a terrible person. She's not always wrong, but like the way she goes about being right is awful. Like no one likes her. She's Karen of the family. However, though, we do find out she's actually a really powerful witch and was the first choice as inheritor after Mary Beth. However, she so thoroughly refused the inheritance because a big part of it is also incest. And she's like, I'm not gonna fuck my grandfather. No, thank you. And also she's like, I'm not fucking with Lasher either, ew. Like she like so thoroughly told everybody to go fuck themselves that the inheritance skips her and goes to her sister Stella instead. And from this point on, um, the, the Mayfair start getting weaker in their magical abilities. Uh, Mary Beth is kind of the last really powerful witch who like had control of Lasher and witchy abilities and everything. Like she was the last really powerful one. Everything kind of trickles down a bit until you get Rowan who's like super powerful. So anyways, moving on to Stella. Stella is a real extra 
person. She is just all over the place. She's basically like, um, like a socialite of this era. It's the 1920s by this point. She is full on living her flapper girl fantasy. She's like the Gatsby of the family. She loves throwing elaborate parties. She's a party girl. That's Stella. She also is attached to Lasher. She sees Lasher. She has all the abilities. She's just not, she has zero interest in like doing anything with them. She just wants to go have fun and go to parties. However, she does eventually have a daughter named Antha and who the father is, is kind of unclear. Um, for the most part, people think it's her brother Lionel is the father because they were always together and hanging out at this era, which, oh my God. Um, however, Stella was also with a lot of guys in this period. So there's really no proof of which guy did it until later on in, in life when, uh, Julian finally, finally fesses up and says that, uh, he was the father of Antha, not Lionel. So God damn it, Julian, you were an old man at this time and you fathered a baby with her. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Regardless of the father, Stella is still living her flapper girl life. She holds, like she gets really into like the spiritualism of the age and has seances and stuff. I think she was kind of a medium. So this was right up her alley. And also she gets really like selective and exclusive in her parties and she stops inviting all of the Mayfairs to them. So at this point in time where like the infighting in the family starts where things start splintering and there's like different factions of Mayfairs now. It's like infighting all the time with this family. And even Stella and Lionel, their brother and sister, allegedly lovers, but they're fighting all the time. And they they stop talking for a bit. And she kind of starts taking up with Pierce, who's Cortland's son. Which is weird, too, because he's a lot younger than her. It's like a whole thing. But anyway, Stella is also kind of running scared. She's scared of something very much in this family. And the Talamasca starts sending people again to try to reach back out to the Mayfairs. It's finally enough time has gone by since Peter. They're going to try to reach back out. The first one ends up dead immediately. Great. The second one, um, Stella does meet with him and she's like really scared of something. You don't find out what it is, but she begs him. He's like, please take me back to the Talamasca. I need to, I need to get out of here. Please help me. So she begs the Talamasca for help. However, sadly, she doesn't ever get to go back to the Talamasca with the agent because, well, he ends up getting killed too. So second agent also dead. And in true Gatsby style, Lionel shoots her at a party. So Lionel walks up with a gun, shoots Stella right in the face. So Stella dead. She's dead now. And Lionel did it. Everyone saw it. And um, Lionel gets committed to an insane asylum, talking about Lasher and witches and like insane things from the outside perspective. And he eventually passes away in the same asylum not too long afterward. Little Antha, she's a kid at the time, but she becomes the next inheritor of the Mayfair estate. Um, and Antha was always considered kind of like sickly and um, Carlotta took her to like a lot of psychiatrists over the years and everything. And overall, she's just basically kept in the house her whole childhood into her teen years all the time. She has very little interaction with the outside world and Antha finally escapes. She runs away to New York and she lives there for quite some time. And she has been living off of like selling antique coins she just happens to always have. So I'm assuming this is a Lasher thing. But um, she she's in New York, she marries a painter and she becomes a writer and some of her stuff is quite good, it gets published and she's living her whole bohemian fantasy. However, she becomes pregnant with this painter. Uh, his name is Sean Lacey. When she becomes pregnant with his baby, he doesn't want her to keep it. And she does want to keep it. So they end up fighting and uh, Sean leaves and he immediately dies in a car accident. And Antha loses her mind. She is just hysterical to the point where it has surpassed normal hysterics and this is like you need to be hospitalized hysterics so she's admitted into an asylum and um eventually she does reach out to Cortland and the family and um she tells him where she is Carlotta hears about it too though so they kind of race each other to New York 
Carlotta gets there first and she has Antha tra transferred to another asylum much closer to New Orleans. And now all of like the Mayfair cousins and, and family, they all are always surrounding Antha and trying to keep her out of Carlotta's hands because obviously Carlotta is not doing anything good to this girl. We're trying to keep Carlotta away. And Antha, she, she gives birth to her baby um, and she names her Deirdre. And after she, she has the baby, she actually starts doing better. She seems to be getting her life back on track. She starts writing again. So things are starting to look up for Antha up until the point she dies from falling out of a third story window in the Mayfair house. So yikes, <laughs> just when she was getting her shit together, falls out a third story window. However, Carlotta does admit later on that she was the one who killed Antha. Basically, Carlotta saw Antha introducing Deirdre to Lasher and she lost her damn mind because like the whole thing with Carlotta is that she is trying to sever the tie with Lasher and she thinks the only way to do it is to thoroughly like reject him like she did. So she's trying to force other people to do it too. And when she sees that happen, she loses her, she loses her shit. She's like, no, Antha, you're not allowed to see Lasher. And if you can't stop seeing him, I'm going to claw your damn eyes out. So she literally rips one of Antha's eyeballs out and Antha's running away. And they get up to the third story and um, Carlotta pushes her out the window. So that's how Antha dies. Carlotta kills her. But there wasn't any evidence of this at the time, so no one knew until, you know, Carlotta admitted it later. What, what to do with Deirdre? Deirdre's an infant, so Deirdre grows up in the Mayfair house with Carlotta <laughs> and a couple of other Mayfair cousins who are a little older. They're in the house. They all kind of look after Deirdre. And, and Deirdre grows up somewhat normal, but she really, she never really stayed in one school for any amount of time because she kept getting kicked out because of all the strange things happening around her and the sightings of Lasher near her. Um, like, who's this like man visiting this child in the playground and stuff? There's always like weird things. She keeps getting kicked out of schools. She tries to run away several times. She tries to commit suicide several times and just all trying to get away from Lasher because she's been raised to believe that he's the devil and he's and she's cursed because of him. So a lot of poison coming in her ear from Carlotta. And eventually Carlotta just like puts her in an asylum and orders shock treatments because she is like her legal guardian. She can tell the doctors to give her shock treatments. So yikes, she is having a very tumultuous teenage existence. <laughs> but um, so she, she gets out of the asylum and she comes home and she runs away again successfully, thank goodness. And they find her in New York and unfortunately she's very delirious and she doesn't know where she is and there's some evidence that she might have been assaulted. And so she's in New York, uh, Cortland goes and picks her up and she moves in with him and his family and she seems to do really well there. She kind of gets her shit back together and to the point where she's able to go off to college. So she goes off to college in Texas, getting away from New Orleans and all of that. And this is where Aaron Leiter comes into the story. So he's a big part of the Mayfair Witches. He's a Talamasca agent. He finally gets sent in again to try to make contact with the Mayfairs. He meets up with Deirdre in Texas at her university. They talk and she believes that he, he doesn't, he's not there to harm her. She's like not going to harm him but she's trying to go the route of ignoring and shutting out Lasher in an attempt to get him to leave. She wants to have a normal life. She's very desperate for it at this point. It is tragic. We were rooting for Deirdre to get a normal life and it just doesn't work out that way for her. And Deirdre does well at college for, for a while, but then of course things start disintegrating. Um, she ends up pregnant and they tell everybody the father was one of her professors who was married at the time and was gonna leave his wife. He also dies in a car accident right at that moment. So um, now she doesn't have a father for her baby, um, but this is all a lie. There was no college professor. The father of her baby is Cortland. And um, it's kind of put out that it wasn't consensual. So Cortland assaulted Deirdre and this is how she ended up pregnant. 
So Carlotta takes her back to New Orleans. She's back there and she's and Carlotta sets up an in-family adoption for her baby. So um, her baby is going to go to Ellie, who's like kind of a, a, a cousin, a distant cousin who lives in California. Cortland tries to stop this from happening. He doesn't want the baby to leave. Cortland, he comes to the house. He's trying to stop it. He's running up the stairs. And then um, he gets pushed down the stairs and ends up dying shortly afterward from like internal injuries. Now, knowing Carlotta's talent for pushing people down things, I'm pretty sure Carlotta pushed him down the stairs and that's why he died. It doesn't seem like something Lasher would do. Lasher would also want that baby to stay. Lasher would be pro Cortland. However, no one was asking Deirdre what she wanted to do. Deirdre wanted to keep the baby. She tried to keep the baby. One of her only friends from high school managed to get in to visit her and she tries to give her a note to give to Aaron Leiter from the Talamasca. Find him and give him this note, I need help. And the, she, the friend gets the note, she's trying to get away. However, she gets it and there's no phone number anymore on it. The card is so old, the phone number's rubbed off. So she can't contact Aaron Leiter. But like, Deirdre tried to save this baby and go off with the Talamasca too. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. So Deirdre gives birth to Rowan and Rowan is the 13th witch, um, the most recent witch in the chain. And immediately the baby's given to Ellie and Ellie leaves to California. So Deirdre never sees the baby again. And she kind of just becomes catatonic. So Carlotta sticks her in another asylum. And then for the rest of her adult life, she's kept in this catatonic state with either shock treatments or just being drugged heavily with Thorazine. Basically, Carlotta will find a doctor to do this to her. Carlotta's making this happen to Deirdre. Deirdre doesn't need these things. Carlotta's doing it to her. However, in Deirdre's mind, she's living like in a dream world all the time and Lasher's there. They're in a relationship with each other in her dreamland. I don't know if this is like a kindness that Lasher is like, you know, maybe helping her and stay into dreams so she's unaware of all the torture she's going through in, in her waking life. And she stays in that state until she passes away um, about 30 years later. So that's Deirdre. But anyway, Ellie and her husband Graham, they adopted Rowan, they bring her back to California. And Rowan has a, a fairly normal childhood away from all the Mayfair, surprisingly. <laughs> so she grows up and she does exhibit some psychic abilities. And, and Ellie just teaches her right away to repress them. She's like, no, 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 no. We don't, we don't do witchy stuff in this family. La, 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 la. Because part of the whole deal with Ellie adopting Rowan is that she has to keep Rowan away from the Mayfairs. Rowan is not to know anything about any of the Mayfairs in New Orleans. She's not to know about witchy stuff. We're trying to sever the tie. Rowan's kept in the dark. That's the whole purpose of this adoption. And since Rowan's been told to suppress those psychic abilities, she kind of turns to science and she goes to medical school. She becomes a neurosurgeon and her psychic abilities tend to manifest in new ways now. She's basically, um, she can heal and also flip side cause death. Um, basically she can touch the person and have a diagnostic understanding of exactly what's wrong with them. And since she's a surgeon, go in there and fix it real easily. So she's really talented. And the, other side of it is also she can kill people kind of by will alone. So she can do both. And she has. She does kill several people, um, a couple by accident and uh, a couple on purpose because, you know, uh, one of them was a person trying to assault her, killed him. And one was like when she was also a little girl and this other girl was picking on her in a playground accidentally. So. Rowan is very aware that she has killed several people and that's the main reason why she devotes herself so hard into being a doctor and saving lives because she doesn't want to just kill people. She wants to help people. And she grows up with no knowledge of any of the Mayfairs. Lasher has never been near her because he's never been around the baby. Does I don't think, I don't know if Lasher knows where the baby is fully, but um, yeah, Lasher's never been around Rowan her whole life. And from this point on, we're now officially going into the plot of The Witching Hour by Anne Rice. So that was just the whole darn backstory of this family. But yeah, so all of the Mayfair witches since ever. <laughs> and all of their gross sexual escapades. Dear Lord, why? 
But on that note, let's just wrap this video up because, oh boy, was this gross. Um, let me know in the comments down below. Um, are you into like stories that have elaborate family trees in them? Because personally, like, that's great. I don't think it added to the story. It's like a lot of history that could have been interspersed in the story more organically than just stopping the plot, having the whole history, and then continuing the plot again. Personally, I don't think it worked in this format, but interesting overall. If you like this video, make sure you give it a like. And if you want to see more videos, make sure you subscribe. And if you want cool exclusive content, including a book club and early access to videos, you can consider becoming a channel member or a patron. The links for that are in the description down below. And on that note, I will see you guys soon. Goodbye.